we have a lot to cover and uh, it's already four so i think we better get going we have to have we have this amazing panel so we'll give them their due share of time and we'll have lots of discussion questions so feel free to send in your questions in the q and a part we will have couple of places where we will pause to get your questions in so uh, please feel free to send your questions in the q and a section uh, hi i'm radhika ayengar i am at the center for sustainable development at the earth institute columbia university the center for sustainable development is the host along with icsd i hope you enjoyed all the panel at icsd this is almost the last session of icsd and so i hope that you've been able to get a lot of uh, discussion points on sustainable development and now we'll see how we want to teach about uh, sustainable development especially sdg 4.7 um thanks for joining everyone so as i mentioned we have a lot uh, of uh, agenda to cover we will have uh, first the introduction on uh, a program that we've launched here at the center for sustainable development along with a lot of our partners called mission 4.7 Uh, we'll also have uh, Dr. Felisa Tibets, uh, who's a human rights expert, talk to us about um, teaching SDG 4.7, along with many other questions that we have for her. So, thanks, uh, Dr. Tibets, for joining. Uh, we have very uh, difficult questions for you, so I hope you are all geared up to uh, have those answers from you. Uh, then we'll have presentations of. um our story maps um uh, that are created by our eco ambassadors over summer is very very exciting to be partnering with sdgs today and esri um we will be focusing on the story maps that our students have created eco ambassadors have created and along with we'll also hear from um uh, ms betsy who will uh, tell us a teachers related perspective on story maps and other Uh, other ideas that she has uh, around story maps so we will also be discussing with andrew uh, on the turn it around cards which is a, again a very fascinating tool that we want to explore as a part of our um, teaching resources so thanks andrew for joining to discuss the turn it around cards that he's gearing up for cop26 um we will also be focusing on demonstrating a guiding principles platform that we created for mission 4.7 uh, aligned to sdg 4.7 it will be great to see what this platform uh, entails and how can we make it much you know how can we make it more robust and how can we actually start using some of the guiding principles um, uh, for sdg 4.7 and then finally next steps we have a long agenda for Uh, what we will be doing uh, for fall and i hope to get a lot of students and teachers interested in this so regarding mission 4.7 this was really something uh, that came up as a collaboration between center for sustainable development at the earth institute columbia university the esd division of unesco sdg academy at uh, unsdsn and global schools along with ban ki moon foundation so we will be uh, we are all here focusing on how do we bring in uh, government uh, leaders policy makers academia civil society and businesses to uh, and uh, businesses to accelerate the implementation of transformative education and what is transformative education how are we defining it will come in the uh, in the guiding principles framework but clearly we need a big collaboration to make uh, education transformative in its agenda and what does it include it includes various different aspects of sdg 4.7 which comes under two big umbrellas one is environmental education or education for sustainable development and the other one is global citizenship education so those are two big umbrellas that we are looking at to bring in the transformative part for uh, sd for mission 4.7 um so i'll ask my colleague tara stafford who has really been thinking about global citizenship education who's really been thinking about how do we make um this environmental education a part of community practice and what are some of those structural changes that we want to get in to change the uh, assumptions that we have Uh, in education right now and what kind of transformation can we get in what are some of the justice related 
aspects and how can we make justice and sustainability as the core of our work so we have the right person to um, you know talk to um, um, between uh, between Tara's questions and Dr. Felisa Tibet who will be answering um, those questions and taking us to a next level of uh, uh, bringing in uh, both the sustainability and the, and the justice element together over to you Tara for the discussion. Thank you so much, Radhika, for that introduction and to Dr. Tibbetts for being with us today. Um, so as we as we kind of get into the conversation, we're really hoping you can help us set the tone for what we're really trying to achieve with Mission 4.7. Um, and I think it's good to remind ourselves of what SDG Target 4.7 calls on us to do, and that is to ensure that all learners acquire the knowledge, skills needed sustainable development, including through education for sustainable development, sustainable lifestyles, human rights, gender equality, promotion of a culture of peace and nonviolence, global citizenship, and appreciation of cultural diversity and culture's contribution to sustainable, uh, sustainable development. So as a scholar on human rights education and global democratic citizenship education, can you share a bit with us uh, your definitions of what human rights education and global citizenship education are and your views on why they are so important to achieving the SDGs and a more just sustainable future for all of us. Thank you, Tara, for the question and thanks for the opportunity to be with you all today. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure I'll be as motivating, to be honest with you, as others of you who are going to be presenting, because I think talking about what's happening in the field and the schools is much more interesting, but I appreciate the opportunity to talk um, about GCED and HRE as they are interrelated and um, also try to bring in ESD as well. I mean, global citizenship education and um, human rights education have been already really well defined by, by the United Nations in, uh, in literature that's been put out by, by UNESCO and by, um, uh, let's see, for the human rights education in the UN Declaration on Human Rights Education and Training. I appreciate the request to come up with a definition, but I think what I'd like to focus on, if that's okay, is how it is that human rights education and global citizenship education are actually mutually reinforcing, how they're related to one another. One of the questions I often have from teachers who are interested in, say, global citizenship education is, is gee, what's the difference between global citizenship education and education for sustainable development and human rights education and peace education, that lovely list of approaches, Tara, that you mentioned in your question, which are related to the 1974 recommendation that was passed at UNESCO in which gave them the platform to actually pursue what I would say are these really values oriented approaches. And in fact, they are interrelated um, many times in terms of pedagogies like uh, critical thinking, trying to, promote transformative action. I'll get into this maybe a bit later. Um, but human rights education does call our attention to justice, as Radhika said. Um, it is the only approach that is specifically focused on justice, in addition to uh, many of the other, I think, shared norms we can find in GCED and ESD. So human rights education is ultimately about um, you know, trying to um, calling attention to norms such as equality, non-discrimination, and legal standards to help ensure human dignity, because human rights is essentially about human dignity. And the legal standards we have through the human rights treaties are just ways of codifying um, how we can um, define human dignity through very specific rights and government's responsibilities vis-a-vis -vis those standards. But it's really just also about how we live with one another. What are some of the norms for living together, which are also taken up by many of those other approaches you mentioned. Um, global citizenship education, actually, the way it's defined by UNESCO, and the way I understand it, also incorporates justice, not exclusively, of course, but inside of global citizenship education, you do find um, norms related to equality and non-discrimination within countries and across countries. Um, both human rights education and GCED, global citizenship education, they wanna call our attention also to everyday life. It's not just talking about theories and processes that are happening outside of the direct experience of learners, but um, 
But challenges, for example, related to globalization, such as fair trade that also relates to ESD, um, that are local but have global um, dimensions. So sort of the local and global are interacting at the same time. I think that the SDGs themselves as a whole are a kind of vision um, for development that promotes the full development of human personality, freedoms, living peacefully together and human rights sort of as a way of life. So GCED and HRE are both a piece of that, you know, building that potential reality through the teaching and learning processes, ESD as well, because I think that there's a lot of thinking up there. Basically the SDGs I think are like a vision that governments have pledged to uphold um, to their best ability and it moves us forward. If the SDGs are fulfilled, it moves us forward in the realization of rights. Um, the right to education, for example, where the SDGs have pushed us into the secondary school level in terms of having that be a sort of requisite, no longer just access to basic education being primary school. Um, also other kinds of rights like gender equality and lifting up vulnerable groups. So inside the SDGs are also these very core norms, which human rights education elevates and which also is a part of GCED. Great, thank you. I love how you kind of drew that distinction between learning about, you know, what are human rights and kind of the more theoretical, technical aspects of it, but then the everyday lived experience and how does this relate to students' lives. And, and also pointing out that, you know, we have all these kind of terms that we group together under 4.7 that can be helpful to bring those lenses for how we can plan uh, learning experiences, but then also creates that challenge of over segmentation. So how do we kind of strike that balance? Um, so I know you've talked a little bit about this already, but just uh, kind of building on what you've already said, what do you see to be some of those core areas of knowledge, attitudes, skills, behaviors uh, that learners should come away with when we're talking about human rights and global citizenship education and uh, SDG 4.7 more broadly? And then how do these kind of knowledge areas and skills look at different age levels, grade levels along the right. lifelong learning spectrum? Of course, that's a great question, Tara. And anybody who is an educator or is involved in curriculum development knows that, you know, when you're developing your lesson plans, you're working on a national curriculum, you've got to be clear about your learning outcomes on the one hand. So you do have to pick those themes that pertain either to your, your you know, your meta picture, global citizenship education, ESD, HRE, but you also need to be so, so conscious of, the learners, their ages, their, their developmental level, their literacy level, um, context of the classroom, national context. So in curriculum development, which I actually teach at Teachers College, there are just many, many considerations. Um, what we have in terms of learning outcomes is a lot of assistance um, from different sources already. So not as the, the, the beginning, it may be just the beginning point, maybe not even the beginning point, but one of the ingredients I would say for thinking about um, developing curriculum for GCED, HRE, ESD, um, even interrelated is just understanding what are the potential competencies or learning outcomes that are identified for each of them, um, even if they're somewhat overlapping. Um, at least we can understand then what, how um, inside those particular approaches, they're understanding goals for learners, which we as curriculum writers and educators can choose from based on which are most relevant and appropriate for our country, for our classrooms, et cetera. So it's not, it, doesn't get, it doesn't get simpler, it only gets a bit more, more complex. Um, so UNESCO, for example, has developed a whole matrix in one of their publications, I think from 2015 on global citizenship education, which is just pages and pages of themes related to global citizenship education that are that can be adapted for younger learners to older learners. Um, similarly, um, the, o, the OSCE ODIR, which is a intergovernmental agency in, in, uh, in, the, um, in Europe, ha has developed competencies for human rights education, So, um, which I'm happy to share with people, um, both those resources in the chat box if they're not familiar with them. So there is some work that's been done by intergovernmental agencies, not to mention others that have tried to define learning outcomes. And typically these are divided between knowledge, goals, skills, 
maybe behavior separate from that and values. And so again, if you're in curriculum writing, you know we are very typically recognizing those as independent dimensions of learning and also independently things we need to focus on when we're developing our curriculum. Both HRE and GCED Terra are really, really diverse and also flexible. So again, it doesn't get simpler. It probably gets more complex <laughs> when you think about like, what could I be teaching in GCED? And what about human rights education? Again, you've got sources that will probably just lay out the land of, of potential learning outcomes across these very different dimensions. But then the decision has to be taken about what is um, what is really age appropriate? What's most appropriate for that particular environment? What, for example, in terms of GCED, what are the local issues or challenges that learners will understand that teachers will be interested to discuss that they can really grasp link up maybe with global issues and, and move forward on. Same with human rights education. We don't want a legalistic approach to human rights education. We want it to begin with learners' own life experience and, and bringing a lens, a human rights values lens to everyday challenges and problems they see that bringing that language in to understand that there are rights associated with it, also responsibilities. So in terms of young learners, if I may, when we think, for example, about young learners, um, what I have found in working in human rights education that it's, even if they're, they're in, in primary school, um, that learners can access the notion of rights and responsibilities and those come together because they know about rules. Um, but we can also, we can also introduce, we can introduce rights, we can introduce responsibilities. Um, when we think about rights and responsibilities in ESD, we can easily, and many schools already do this, introduce learners to the importance of taking care of their environment. It's not just keeping your school clean, it's also caring for the animals, it's caring for the plants, it's caring for our planet. And young learners understand that even if they don't know the language of rights, so really early on, you can talk about responsibilities and care. And I think it's really important, in fact, to begin with really, really young learners um, to, um, to instill in them the notion that they, that they have responsibility to care. And, and to help make things right. Of course, older learners can um, grasp more complex and abstract topics, that's classic. Uh, they can retain more information. So with older learners, both for GCED and for HRE, and I, I would say also for ESD, you can really present more difficult challenges. So older learners you know, can be exposed to the, some of the more intractable and difficult problems like genocide or, um, you know, violence against women, uh, climate change, which we have to be so careful about, as we know, like, you know, because if we present to our learners these, these super heavy, heavy problems that they have very, may feel very little agency to be able to address, we could, you know, we could promote cynicism and, um, and um, detachment from the problems. So it's really, really important as we introduce these challenges to make sure that we provide learners with the opportunities to address something very concrete in their own environment and to, and to see some success with that. So um, um, it's really important they have this chance to do something positive and concrete. But you know, it's not just schools, of course. I mean, we're lifelong learners. When we think about the SDGs, when we think about our roles as active citizens or members of our community, if we think about human rights, if we think about um, responsible, you know, um, responsible uh, use of our environment. I would say that there's even more opportunities to be engaged in those as we get older. So I think it's good also to, to remember that the SDGs are also not about form, only about formal schooling as well as non-formal education, but lifelong learning. So setting up all of us, including our learners through their early experiences in school to be responsible in the ways to, to bring a, help bring about like the vision that SDG is putting out for us. Great, and, and I, I think schools too can serve as kind of those community hubs to bring in that kind of lifelong learning and get the families involved and bring the community organizations into the, the formal learning process too. And you know that's something we'd love to uh, hear from teachers about the feasibility of that or, or what they've done in, in terms of those, those kind of uh, avenues as well. Um, so so uh, in your research, 
what so I know you spoke a little bit about some of the experiences you've seen of, of what what works at primary level uh, with, or with older students. So in your research in the field, um, what what are some of the kinds of teacher support, learning resources, pedagogical approaches, or school environmental or cultural characteristics that you found to lead to some of the most profound shifts in some of the classroom practice to, to bring human rights education and, and global citizen education to life? That's a, a, a really great question, Tara. And um, what I, I'm mindful of is my one of the objectives in my own work, which is to move us away from the, you know, the maverick teachers who figure out how to do human rights education really well in their classrooms, the gold standard where they're, you know, it's education about, through and for human rights. And you could say that they're probably maverick teachers also doing global citizenship education or ESD. And they're, 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 they're often, you know, one of the few teachers in their school, unfortunately, really taking it on. So one of my professional goals is to, is to use the maverick teachers and the fantastic work that some teachers have been doing for many years as examples, but to create environments where every teacher can feel incentivized and supported to teach um, lessons, um, organized learning experiences for their students that are, are really, um, that, that get at GCED, ESD, I would say also, and, and HRE. So, so that speaks to system, a systems approach, which I know Mission 4.7 is about. I mean, what I like about Mission 4.7, I'll plug you guys, I really believe it, is that you're working on, you know, the curriculum supports, which we all want to see, you know, very thoughtfully developed curriculum supports, very essential, but you're also looking at other stakeholders because teachers in, in school systems need to have spaces in the curriculum to teach GCED and HRE, right? Human rights education. Even though there's some research, this is not my own research, Tara, but there is research that shows that human rights as a term has really become much quite popularized in terms of textbooks internationally. And I think um, like the majority of national curriculum studied by UNESCO some years ago also had some reference to human rights, but often that's a very minimal re reference. You know, it's like, for example, mentioning the founding of the United Nations, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, end of story, which is not really bringing alive the human rights values and thinking about, you know, issues in your country and how the human rights perspective might help to, uh, you know, ignite, bring about transformation, social change. So, um, so, but there needs to be some space in the curriculum for GCED, ESD, and HRE, so teachers know it's okay to teach it, and and the spaces need to be not minuscule, <laughs> you know, they should be larger. What some teachers do now is if they find a foothold or a toehold for teaching human rights education, which is sort of my thing, um, if they have flexibility in the system, if it's if it's a system where they, for example, open hours or classroom hours and they can, you know, they can, they can have time to do interesting uh, lessons that are maybe going to take longer than the, the ones they normally have uh, time for, then they might take that initiative and use that space, for example, to teach HRE. Um, but many times teachers are working in systems that are highly regulated or um, they're feeling the pressure to, to meet curriculum standards and it's a very overpacked curriculum or prepare their teachers for their students for testing, which is certainly a, a stress here in the United States and increasingly in other countries as well. And in that kind of environment, it's really hard, even for the teachers who have, are motivated to do so, to actually have the space to teach GCED, HRE, ESD, unless, unless it's really you know, made uh, room for in the national curriculum. Um, so supports. Um, learning resources like the kind that Mission 4.7 is developing and which are also out there, UNESCO has worked on it, other people as well and other organizations. Space in the curriculum is super, super important. And in conjunction with um, having space in the curriculum because GCED and HRE are so context specific, in order for it to be meaningful, it really needs to speak to students' everyday lives. That means teachers need to be able to know how to adapt and bring alive the lessons they might be handed by 
for example, Mission 4.7 or UNESCO or Oxfam if it's GCED. That means that teachers need to know how to do that, how to adapt and make things come alive. So that also speaks to teacher education and how important it is to bring on board teacher education institutions and preparing new teachers to teach GCED, ESD, HRE using participatory methodologies, which are really important for these approaches because we really want students to become motivated and activated to try to make a difference. And that means it's not textbook memorization, that is for sure. And the whole school approach, sometimes teachers, even if you've got it in the curriculum, it really helps if they've got a principal who is really interested to them to be innovative. Maybe they want it make their school an ESD school or an HRE school or a GCED school. You know, UNESCO has this Associated Schools of Peace network and sometimes schools take on themes. And when they do that, the teachers may try to coordinate lessons addressing a particular topic and other wonderful special events that can be happening in the school community as a whole to lift up the values and themes. So many, many supports are important. Again, national curriculum frameworks. I know that Mission 4.7 is working with governments via V, also UNESCO, super important. Resources for the educators, you've all are working on that. Um, teacher education, very important to bring in the teacher education institutions because research is showing the gap between even those teacher education institutions that are preparing educators to do this kind of wonderful work in the classroom and then they arrive in schools and they're deflated. There's not much space or opportunity for them to teach the way they'd like to. They revert back to maybe how they were taught as a student. So we really have to get all this in sync and communities of practice, living communities of practice, even online ones that educators can use to inspire each other and learn from each other. All those supports and more would be really helpful, I think. Wow, thank you so much, Dr. Timmons. I feel like you really covered everything. My last question was gonna be about some of the barriers and how we overcome them, but I feel you, you pretty much covered all that already. Um, and I really, I, I like how you talked about the whole school approach and kind of creating that space in the curriculum for teachers to feel that confidence to be able to pursue these avenues of, of education. And I think not just space in the curriculum, but space in their, their school today, right? To have, to have that whole school approach, collaborate with other teachers. How can we teach in a transdisciplinary way to address these issues? So I think we have our homework cut out for us and we're on oh, our yes. <laughs> <laughs> we certainly do. But you know, in the end, if we're educators, we just do what we can in our environment. You know, we can't, there's the big picture, man. There's everything matters. Everything we do with students every day matters. And that's what we have to keep our, our eye on. So thank you for giving me the chance to, to speak with you, Tara, and um, to be with all of you today. Thank you so much for sharing your very valuable insights and, and experience with us, Dr. Tibbetts. All right, well, thanks so much. So let's, uh, I think we're going to move on to our next uh, section of the event. So uh, Radhika was bringing up our slides. So we're going to talk to you a little bit about our Eco Ambassador Program now, which is uh, an initiative of our Center for Sustainable Development at the Earth Institute. Um, and the, the goal of the Eco Ambassador Program is, I mean, it fits nicely under the SDG 4.7 umbrella because uh, we're working to build the knowledge and skills for students to not only understand sustainable development challenges, but how can they identify solutions and then be agents of change in their communities to help bring those solutions out. Um, I think we'll go to the next slide. So we have our, uh, this is just a little bit of the theory of change or Eagle Ambassador Initiative. Our goal of the program is to equip young people with the knowledge and skills for conducting scientific research and advocating for both the individual solutions they can implement in their own lives as well as systemic solutions that they can influence in their uh, communities, countries, and globally. Um, and so we kind of cover the scientific training aspect of the program by linking learners with experts from Columbia University and some of our partners and they see training and mentorship on uh, how to do their own research, how to identify research questions. Um, and then also the advocacy side of things. How do you then take the findings from your research to share and to formulate solutions and to build momentum and support for those solutions uh, in your communities and amongst your decision makers. And our goal is for, for by tackling both those uh, broad skill areas to, to 
help young people have the skills and the confidence they need to be agents of change. So this summer, if we go to the next slide, or so this is just a little bit about where our programs have uh, reached so far. You know, we've had lots of folks joining our Eco Ambassador program from around the world, uh, especially this past summer, which we'll talk a little bit more about uh, what that program was focused on. Um, so this, this summer, we did an initiative in partnership with SDGs Today, with ESRI, Mission 4.7, of course, uh, Global Schools Program, helping us to get uh, educators from around the world involved. And our goal with the program, uh, if we go to the next slide, um, was to have young people gain knowledge. So the, the program was focused on SDG 4, uh, 14 and how to use digital storytelling tools like those that ESRI has with ArcGIS and their story maps platform, which we'll hear more about and we'll see some examples. Um, how can we use these tools to tell compelling stories about uh, SDG 14 and the SDGs more broadly and to uh, build momentum for solutions. And our goal with those uh, young people and educators who took part in the program this summer, they went through uh, workshops on how to use the different software tools, storytelling best practices. Um, now we wanna take their final story map products and uh, turn those into lesson plans that teachers can use to uh, create these exciting learning opportunities in their classrooms. Um, and so the story maps we have, we have them um, on a, a special collection on, the, on our website. Um, that shows all the story maps that the students uh, created through the program this summer. Um, we're going to see a few of those examples uh, momentarily. So we want to just just to talk a little bit more about what we did this summer. Um, we have a few uh, of our partners, which we're so happy to have with us today. We have Michelle Thomas from Esri Story Maps team. She's the community and web manager uh, with Esri Story Maps team. We have Miriam Rabii, who's the manager at SDGs Today, which is part of the UN. Sustainable Development Solutions Network. And then we have Betsy Freeman, who's the coordinator of green initiatives and sustainability at Reddington Middle School with the Reddington Township Public Schools in New Jersey. Um, and so Michelle and Miriam played key roles in helping to lead our workshops over the summer. And then um, Ms. Freeman got some of her students involved in the program and helped to guide them and make it a great learning opportunity um, as part of her, her uh, work. So we wanna hear a little bit from each of you um, just about what you see the benefits of the program to be, how we can take this forward. And then um, maybe we can start with Michelle, then Miriam, and then Betsy, you can uh, introduce your students and we'll start looking at some of their story maps. So I'll turn over to you, Michelle. So thanks um, everyone. Um, to our partners, uh, it's been so much fun being involved in this uh, this summer and such a great learning opportunity for us and so exciting um, to see the students work through um, this program. Um, congratulations to all of our Echo Ambassador participants um, on successfully completing the program, but also making amazing stories. And I know um, people will read and be excited and will make a difference. And that's really the whole point of this is, you know, um, creating beautiful stories um, that uh, that move locally, but reach globally. So I'll share a little bit here with you. So what is the story map? A lot of people ask, what are RGS story maps? Um, for those of you who don't know much about it, it is Esri's uh, digital storytelling tool. Um, it's uh, RGS story maps combine interactive maps and data with multimedia content and text to tell stories about the world. They work on all screen sizes. One of the great things about the product is you can build um, on uh, multiple devices, but you can also preview on multiple devices to make sure that things work correctly and um, they're accessible around the world um, and by all of your audiences. They incorporate an interactive builder. I consider story maps, I like to say, it's like a great big Lego bucket. Um, you have all of these little pieces, just like you would with Lego. You know, you have the, the, the big block and you have the square and you have the rectangle. Um, you have all of these multimedia pieces, these text pieces, these interactive pieces that you drop into a builder um, and you can move those pieces around to create something beautiful um, and exciting and interactive and play with it. And if you don't like it, you can knock it down just like a Lego uh, tower and start all over again. And it's, it's really um, intuitive and easy. And um, uh, you'll see what the students have built. It's very exciting. 
And an easy thing for teachers and for administrators is that um, the story maps um, are actually hosted by Esri in the cloud. We have a lot. We can tell you a little bit more um, after this if you're interested, but um, uh, school programs um, are free um, uh, for K through 12. Um, and a lot of clubs and nonprofit organizations that serve that community are also um, free or low price too. So um, it's, it's a real advantage to get uh, uh, educators using um, stories and teaching stories and using them in the classroom. So believe it or not, storytellers are telling about 2,000 or more stories a day globally, which is so exciting. Um, if you want to learn a little bit more about um, story maps themselves, you can go to esri.com slash story maps. It'll tell you all about it. It'll give you sample um, stories and lessons and all that great stuff. Um, uh, but those 2,000 storytellers a day, I like to tell everybody that I have the best job in all of Esri um, because my job is to look for great stories all day, stories like the ones that the students made um, and look for things that um, really stand out and share them um, on website, our website, on social media, in a gallery, in newsletters. That's my job is to find wonderful stories. I can't imagine it's much better than that. Um, uh, one thing uh, for teachers to know is that um, a lot of these uh, stories do cover SDGs. Um, they may not directly say SDG, but all of the themes of the SDGs are running through many of the stories that we see. Um, and the most popular place to find um, stories and, and art GIS story maps is in the classroom. Educators and teachers um, and students um, around the world are, um, are leading the way. Uh, with stories, which I think is pretty exciting. Um, last year, uh, we partnered um, with SDSN on a 2020 Storytellers of the Year competition, and the entire competition was based on SDGs. Uh, we had a student track and a professional track, and people from around the world, it was seven, uh, 47 countries in the end, um, were eligible, submitted eligible stories um, to this competition all about the SDGs. And I just wanted to share one story with you. As you can see, many different um, types of stories, one about COVID and equity, another about indigenous tribes, another about um, uh, nomadic tribes. And then the students wrote about femicides in Turkey, um, environment, and two uh, wrote about environmental issues. But I love the story behind the stories. That's the best part. Um, uh, this story was by three, uh, three students um, who had never used GIS or storytelling ever um, and uh, heard about the competition in a classroom and um, they do not attend the same school, but they are friends and have a real passion and um, they got together and created this beautiful story because they wanted to raise awareness about this issue. Um, and uh, that was really the benefit of the competition was to have your story share, shared globally. So it dealt with gender equality, has a beautiful theme, um, you know, this black and red, it really stands out. They use a lot of really nice graphics throughout the entire thing. And one of my favorites is that they actually have a map here and you can click on the map and get the stories of real people in different countries and how they've been impacted as well, which I think is pretty amazing. So that's how we kind of got involved in uh, with SDSN and the amazing site that, um, that they have SDGs today. I would uh, very strongly recommend that you vis visit the SDGs today site. Um, they have um, stories in collections um, for each of the different SDGs to give you an idea of what kind of storytelling is going on in organizations and with students and teachers. Um, they have an amazing um, uh, set of examples plus data to go with that. But um, what you wanna know is what, I, what, what, what did I learn this summer um, if I'm a teacher? Um, I have to say that the thing that I took away from this experience this summer is that, um, you know, changing the world is hard. It just is. Um, and I love the approach of this program which is we have these global issues, but they all start local, they all start at home. And all of these students, regardless of where home was, 
picked something they knew and picked something they were really passionate about and told that story. And um, that was one of the great things about this is just making sustainable development goals, these larger issues that we're facing um, together, um, bringing it home so that students could actually understand it and come up with real solutions for their own communities and then suggest solutions for other people to follow and great resources. So um, that was really my first big takeaway um, from that. I think also, again, students picked things they were very passionate about. You know, um, uh, you know it's so energizing, one um, group, uh, picked uh, uh, something about a local river, another group picked something about a local lake, another um, really dug into what's going into trash in my school and how can, you know, uh, where does that go? It goes into the ocean. So what can we do to help with that? And then another um, student who really inspired me, a middle schooler who chose fashion and how does fashion and, and the way that fashion works behind the scenes, how does that affect our oceans? That was so amazing. So um, I thought that that was fantastic. I, I think another um, key takeaway for me for um, working um, for teachers is some of these students work together in groups and some of them worked um, individually. And I thought for me, um, that was super exciting just because it really gives you the opportunity to adapt to what the student needs and your classroom situation and you can go big uh, with a 10 group um, uh, a 10, you know, group of 10 students telling a story, each bringing their own um, strengths to that story, or you can have one person um, working on the story. So I think that's a, a good opportunity for teachers. And then I think finally, um, there are just so many other skills that I think they learned along the way, aside from learning about SDGs and especially um, SDG 14 and, you know, GIS and mapping. They learned a lot about designs. They learned about how to create a survey, um, but they took a really interdisciplinary approach. And from an academic standpoint, I love storytelling just because it brings in science, it brings in literature, it brings in design, it brings in how do you tell a research, you know, with research papers, how do you cite things, you know, all of the things that students need to learn in school, they can bring sustainable development, excitement about a project, group projects or individual projects together into something that's interdisciplinary and usable and the classroom, which is really important. So um, we're so excited to welcome our uh, new storytellers to our larger storytelling community. Very excited about that. And we hope um, that those storytellers will uh, submit their stories to the uh, Story Maps Ocean Challenge. Right now, Esri and the National Geographic, um, we are hosting a, an ocean challenge in which um, there are two tracks. There's a high school 14 to 18 track and then um, a college track um, to tell impactful stories about the ocean health and exploration, just like the students now picking something that is they're passionate about and you know, what, what's the issue? How do we address it? How do you get people involved? Same kind of thing. So we do hope that the ECHO ambassadors will um, submit their stories to this competition because, um, you know, I know they put a lot of um, time into it. We've had a lot of fun uh, reviewing them. Um, the challenge does close on October 22nd. Um, and you can learn all about it at esri.com slash story maps slash contest. And with that, I will turn it over to you, Jen. Thank you so much, Michelle. I love how you brought up all the different skills that we need to learn and how they can be learned through the process that, that we went through this summer. And yes, we do hope that everyone does participate in the Story Maps Challenge. And if anyone on this call uh, is interested in joining, we do have resources on our Ed4SD uh, YouTube channel. All the workshops we did this summer are there to help walk you through the skills. Um, so we'll share that uh, later on in the event as well. Um, so thanks so much, Michelle. And uh, Mary, I'll turn it over to you if you'd like to share a few words about the summer. Thank you, uh, Tara. Um, and thanks for the opportunity uh, to be with, your, with you uh, today. It's been a great pleasure to work with you and the Eco Ambassadors team. Uh, one of our objectives at SDGs today is to promote geospatial literacy and encourage the integration of geospatial information systems uh, in SDG-related initiatives um, in collaboration with our, our partner, ESRI. 
So we were very excited about the opportunity to work with eco ambassadors and um, help introduce different geospatial concepts and tools, uh, particularly the um, ArcGIS story map tool. Um, to build on uh, some of the points that Michelle already uh, shared with us, um, data-driven stories are a powerful medium of communication that can propel action towards the SDGs. Um, and each of the stories that the students presented to us this summer was a call to action that could inspire other students around the world to take a step forward towards implementing SDG 14 in their communities. Um, these are the kinds of stories we need, stories that use the data to not only inform us about the state of sustainable development as it is today, but also make the data and what it's trying to represent more accessible to those who might think of the SDGs as a high level framework um, that is only relevant to policymakers. Um, so data-driven stories are supposed to offer tangible actions anyone anywhere can commit to in order to inform uh, policies that can impact um, environmental sustainability or social justice um, at a local and, and global level. Um, SDGs today is uh, happy to support the continuation of the program um, and to help amplify the amazing story maps uh, that were created by the students this summer. Uh, we'll be creating an Eco Ambassador story map collection uh, for our website. And uh, we look forward to learning more from the Eco Ambassadors. Thank you so much, Miriam. And it's been so great to, to have your uh, expertise informing all the work we did this summer. Um, let's turn it over to uh, Miss Betsy Freeman now. Maybe you can speak a little bit about how you kind of approached uh, the work with your students this summer and then go ahead and introduce them so we can uh, see some of the great work they did. Great, thank you. Thank you, Tara. And um, I think the mark of, you know, uh, the success of a teacher is definitely going to be the students. So. I am going to bring out student voice as much as possible. And the kids who are here are, um, are used to that. The, um, I, you know, it's, I cannot thank the Eco Ambassador Network enough and all the work that um, you do through the Center for Sustainable Development and, um, and ESRI, you know, and working with the UN because, Miriam, you're, absolutely right for so many of the kids and it's some abstract thing that's out there that's doing good but does that good you know you know kind of trickle down and do we understand it and you know we're school we do model un you can see you know right in back of me here i'm still in the classroom you know we have the sdgs up on the wall we use the sdgs as our sandbox for our curriculum and um, you know all of the solutions based um, learning that we do, which I think ties back to you know what uh, Felisa was saying that we don't want climate change to be this terrible, daunting monster that you know they um, kids and adults you know cannot um, you know get their hands around and then, you know, the practice, learn to be more resilient and adaptive. So um, just to Esri, you know, the, of course, I heard of story maps um, a lot in graduate school by every person that I knew that did a, a degree in public health or, you know, a, a degree in business. And, and so, you know, I've been to a number of conferences and of course I saw Charlie Fitzpatrick, who's you know very energetic, you know, out there on the floor, and I and I consider myself a techie. I'm a career changer. It speaks a little bit to maybe what Felicia was talking about with um, teacher education. I went into teaching because when I was corporate, I thought, oh my God, why are people thinking like this? You cannot look at a piece of paper and manage care and let that error go because that is potentially somebody's life or when do we start to make those uh, kind of decisions and I kind of drilled down to think ah you know what it's probably when people learn to make decisions and think and so when I decided to make the change over into education 
I did um, a standard kind of teacher education. And then of course I did, um, you know, teacher's college at Columbia. So I have that really rich uh, social justice vein, which had I not had that, I, I don't miss my value set is probably that I wouldn't have gone into teaching with, you know, sit down, be quiet, you know, take the test. But I think it's that confidence that, um, and understanding that education can and should be values-based and that it should be about ethical decision-making and confronting the abstract and contributing to society and all those good things. And I think that's what brought me to the, the, the SDGs naturally and brought all of these kids who are gonna tell their stories um, about the SDGs. So I will um, just say again with the story maps, you know, probably so many schools out there are one-to-one -one districts now and one-to-one -one Chromebooks. And the Chromebooks, it, it all worked wonderfully with creating the story maps online as, and as I'm sure every teacher out there will say, as soon as a student starts developing a presentation, don't play with the fonts, make sure your research gets in there. It's the important part of the story, but I think what you will hear from these students who are going to share the, their stories, that the data-driven nature of the tool, which of course now is going to bring that like very daunting feel for uh, teachers, students, adults alike, you know, is that going to be hard? And I think I'll let the students take over now and tell exactly what they found and, and what they learned. And I will say the common thread that we have um, uh, definitely in the, in the culture here is that um, knowledge cannot be inert. And so I think each one of the students will also talk about um, the, their own story and actions therein. So um, with uh, me today is um, uh, Chris Sorrell, who will um, start us off. He is um, two years out of middle school. And I think it speaks to um, the dedication and service that you know, uh, kids develop when we give them that opportunity to do so. And then um, Tatiana Halinka, who, um, uh, probably one of the most amazing young environmentalists I have, um, you know, ever met. Bonnie Magadri, our student council president, who couldn't be with us today because she's a tennis player and had a conflict. And then, of course, one of our uh, peer leaders over in Philadelphia, um, Sophia Berman, who um, I think will exemplify that vein of um, making meaning in the world. So, uh, Chris. Go ahead and take it away. Yeah, um, I just want to start by saying thank you uh, to, uh, for giving this opportunity to present today. Uh, yeah, my name is Chris, as Ms. Freeman said. Um, I'm a student at Phillips Exeter Academy. Um, and uh, our, as uh, Ms. Freeman said, uh, our colleague uh, Bonnie won't be here today. Um, but what we all have in common, me, Tatiana, and Bonnie, is that we're all graduates of Rankin Middle School. And we care about the environment and our oceans. And we know that our waste that we produce in our schools can harm our life and our future. And the story map collection that we're presenting is called Drowning in Waste, Our Reality of Microplastics and Food Waste in Our Ecosystems, Communities, and School Lunch Table. So I'll just start by uh, pulling this up. Um, so our story map, um, our first one was mostly inspired about like uh, how much we saw food getting thrown out every day at school and uh, where does this mostly happen and it's mostly at the lunch table actually um, so if you think about your average day at the cafeteria you're, you're gonna have a lot of plastic being produced every day uh, from plastic utensils plastic packaging um, you know plastic water bottles and so on and there's just a lot of plastic and food waste in general and it's kind of hard to tell how much your school is actually producing because you know you, you can see how much you're producing, but uh, not so much how everyone else is producing. 
Um, and uh, another thing we want to look at was the true cost of food. Approximately one third of all food produced in the world is wasted today. And uh, that's uh, over uh, 1.3 billion tons of fruits, vegetables, meat, dairy, fish, and grain. And that could end up either lost, not coming in from the farm, or even not reaching the place it's supposed to get to. And that could provide enough food to feed undernourished people. But it's not just you know a social or humanitarian issue. It's also a worry for the ecosystem, especially our oceans. And um, I have a quote here from the Rockefeller Foundation, which relates to this topic. And it says, as a country, we spend a, a total of 1.1 trillion a year on food. But when the impacts of the food system on different parts of our society, including rising healthcare costs, climate change, and biodiversity loss are factored in, the bill grows. Accounting for these costs, the true cost of food is at least 3.2 trillion a year, triple the current expenditure of food. Uh, so we waste a lot of resources getting food, um, which eventually ends up at the landfill. And basically, if we could reduce that amount, um, we would also help our environment, reducing methane, a powerful uh, greenhouse gas. And as middle schoolers, we didn't really understand the gravity of the situation at our local middle school. So we just did like a food waste audit um, where we measure the amounts of food and plastic wasted after uh, one grade of lunch. And if you multiply that by three periods, 200 kids produce this amount of waste here on screen. Uh, and that would be uh, around 500 or 600 total students uh, times 180 school, uh, school days and over 2,000 schools in New Jersey. And realize that um, we can do whatever we can on our end, but we need to start with education because uh, change needs to happen at the start. It needs to be integrated into our education. So uh, next up is like understanding mindsets and for us to really progress as a school and to reduce our food waste, we need to understand it from the perspective of someone who is at the school. Um, so we just realized that there's overall just a lack of education surrounding reducing, recovering, and recycling, as well as a lot of onus being on the consumer and the person in the cafeteria to uh, know where they're putting their waste out. Uh, here are some more pictures from our food waste audit. And um, our, our most produced waste was plastic waste. And yeah, uh, here's uh, some tips if you want to conduct your own food waste audit. And uh, so you can organize a team, set a date, uh, decide what types of food you want to focus on, uh, to set up the station, and figure out why people are, are not eating a certain item or wasting it. And you separate it into certain categories. Uh, collect data and use it to improve. And here are some sources if you want to uh, look out for it. And um, so, uh, spoiled waste was like kind of our introduction um, to all this matters um, and our personal reaction. And we, uh, as a result, we created our food audit. Um, but we want to also see what happened in our personal community and uh, what ha might happen in your community. So in our current town, Reddington, uh, we create uh, the township of Reddington instituted a plastic uh, bag ban and uh, this started it before uh, the state of New Jersey did so that was just an example of what our local community do did and there was a lot of plastic pollution in the Raritan River very close to where we live and we know that's going to impact life below water as well as uh, life on land eventually so we're gonna. T uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Tatiana, who will talk a little bit more about what actually happens to the plastic waste and give us metrics on how really how much is wasted. Good afternoon. My name is Tatiana, as Chris mentioned, and this story mate, um, map to where all of this plastic goes contemplates the true cost of our consumer actions, which is unseen for most of society. Unfortunately, lying in our rivers or the deep blue sea. Even if you live hundreds of miles away from the shore, there's a pretty good chance your trash will end up in the ocean. Knowing that 80% of the plastic in our ocean comes from terrestrial sources, ending up in landfills or in global ecosystems as waste. What's worse is that plastic with common additives and chemicals can take up to 400 years to decompose. For most of us, plastic is incorporated into our whole lifestyle, not knowing half of the consequence is action on our part. How long we've been obsessing over plastics is a question that has been asked for over a century or since the 1900s when the first version of plastic was made. 
The scarring statistics of plastics left some of our community members in our town to reflect, advocate their voice, and take action. As Kirsch mentioned briefly, Reddington Township passed a ban on single-use plastics, such as single-use plastic bags, straws, and foam containers, reinforcing the idea that sustainable practices must be implemented into our community. For example, through our school district, we offer various sustainable practices or, and alternatives, such as reusable trays, recycling bins in every classroom corner, compost bins, refilling water bottle stations, and education on our environment and our consumer actions. Since we did the food audit, we met with our food service sustainability manager, and we discussed how the plastic that we use for packaging is boxes made out of bottles that can be recycled and we no longer use styrofoam trays. The crisis of microplastics in our oceans and rivers begin at school, yet our solution lies right in front of us, and it's the future. As advisor board members to our National Green Honor School Society, we still work with the students there to move forward and towards greener practices. When we're talking about change, anyone who lives on the East Coast of the United States experienced Hurricane Ida and all the flooding water that came down with it. Hurricane Ida struck the United States, devastating 1 million people down South while cre creating much debris amongst our environment. However, up North, Hurricane Ida claimed the lives of at least 25 individuals in New Jersey, and that was more than in any other state. Our local Raritan River, in fact, was 27 feet higher than it normally is on Thursday, September 2nd. And in Brownbrook, the Raritan River rose to 42 feet, a record high during that same day. This type of storm would have been extremely unusual 20 or 50 years ago. In fact, the devastation that would become of Hurricane Ida, among other hurricanes, was um, likely strengthened by climate change. As it passed over exceptionally hot water in the Gulf of Mexico, it went from a Category 1 to a Category 4 storm in less than 24 hours. To put it this way, as the Earth heats up, it aids the additional heat energy, intensifying the conditions of hurricanes like Ida over the ocean. And as hurricanes develop over water, they absorb more moisture, which is released as more rain. And in consequence, the story map shows the development of the hurricane storm storm and the before and after images of how the flood destroyed some of our local towns in New Jersey. While most people think of hurricanes affecting more coastal regions, they also have a substantial impact on interior rivers. When a hurricane or flood strikes, everything is completely transformed. Calm river and water becomes a filthy mess, trees, um, dead animals, and garbage debris, most likely later on becoming microplastics, begin to float down the river and into other bodies of water. As students, leaders, and community members for this earth we all share, we care about our rivers because it is the source of life for us and for others. During the final months of school, a team and community members of active thinkers have the opportunity to release raised trout in the South Branch Raritan River and members of the team raised the trout through their aquaponic environment. At the event, we tested the water quality of the river location, such as the temperature, pH, nitrates, ammonia, and water clarity. The outcome of the event was opportunities taken advantage of to create action. And the only thing we can blame for these intensifying hurricane conditions, damaging our rivers, oceans, and homes is climate change. It is our current reality and it can become our future too if we don't do something soon. What the world needs therefore is action, both from students and adults. And as oceanographer Sylvia Earle once said, with every drop of water you drink, every breath you take, you're connected to the sea. No matter where on earth you live, most of the oxygen in the atmosphere is generated by sea. It is the worst of times, but it is the best of times because we still have a chance. We still have the chance to create the future we want with all of our oceans while incorporating SDG 14, if we have a plan. And the plan processing starts now. Thank you for this opportunity to let us share our story that students and the youth have the power to create actions in their school communities and on Earth.
sorry, I was, I was just muted there. Um, before we wrap up, I just want to say thank you uh, to the Columbia University team uh, and the Eco Ambassador Network, especially Dr. Yangar and Ms. Uh, Stafford. And uh, I also want to say thank you to the Esri team and most importantly, um, our advisor, uh, Ms. Freeman, uh, for all of her help and all of the people's help that you asked for. And um, our projects lead to action and education now online. And we want to empower the kids and students in our community uh, because they're our future, uh, simply put. And uh, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Sophia if she wants uh, to share her uh, presentation. All right. Um, hi, I'm Sophia, and thank you so much. That was absolutely, I love watching and um, really seeing Chris's and Tatiana's and everyone's work come together. It was absolutely such a phenomenal summer uh, to use um, my time. And so um, I am a senior. I live in a tent high school near Philadelphia, and I would just say this is my first time ever using ArcGIS and as a maps. I was uh, I took AP Human Geography my sophomore year and I was excited. I was like, I'm getting back into what I'm uh, used to. And I have to say my absolute favorite was looking at maps and seeing and thinking to myself, what would they reveal? What could this, how could this data be used in storytelling? Which is a way I've never thought of storytelling before um, and how I could use that in climate storytelling. And so it truly evolves the way we storytell and I, I uh, cannot wait to integrate this uh, back into my school, hopefully um, in one of my classes and also clubs. So without further ado, um, this is my ArcGIS story, which is all about how all life on earth relies on the health of our oceans, rivers and streams for food, energy and water. Yet, yeah, sorry, I'm, I'm using the different desktop, not used to this. Yet for generations, we've treated our waters and its resources as inexhaustible. It's a tale of tragedy of the commons. But my story begins here on land and describes how through social inclusion, cohesion, education, sustainable practices, and good governance, we the people can turn this tale into one about the common good. And I had laid that out in this video. So that's what I'm basically saying. And that's my high school at 7 p.m. <laughs> um, so as I said, my story begins here on land and um, describes, excuse me, um, excuse me, we can evolve the way we think about environmental governance when we look at these different um, pillars. And mine starts with how the ocean is a common. And what's a common? A common is something we all use, it's something we all need and share. And so that makes the ocean a life vessel for all. It's a life support, supporting a diverse amount of things from environmental, economic, and social needs, from regulating the climate, providing over half of the oxygen we breathe to storing 50 times more carbon dioxide than our atmosphere. We all rely on the ocean for our health. But who constitutes all? Are we privileging humans over life underwater? Well, healthy water to me equals healthy health for all. And that includes all different types of life from life underwater to humans to animals. Our ocean is a magnificent common and our livelihoods are inextricably intertwined with it. But today, the effects of human activities such as climate change, ocean acidification, nutrient pollution, plastic waste shipping, and overfishing are stressing ocean life and its natural resources. As I had mentioned earlier, the tragedy of our oceans is really one which starts on land. In fact, 80% of pollution to the marine environment comes from land. That's a huge amount. And a lot of this is non-point source pollution. You might hear that in your biology class, which means it's pollution that comes from a whole diffuse of sources. And this happens through runoff, as Chris had mentioned, through, or through Hurricane Ida. Um, we're having excessive streams. I was just down at the Schuylkill River cleaning up and helping um, remove some of the dirt that had all clumped up um, or gunk with the plants. And right where we were was all underwater just two days earlier. Um, that's how 
real it is, um, to put it into perspective. And as water flows across land, it carries debris, litter, chemicals, fertilizers, and all these other types of toxic substances that are harmful to our rivers, streams, and ultimately our oceans. Um, here are just some graphics and facts. <laughs> um, and but my story, as I said, is about land. And agriculture is actually one of the leading causes of water degradation. And in the US, agriculture pollution is the top source of contamination in rivers and streams. This is what nutrient pollution is. It's caused by excess nitrogen and phosphorus we find in our fertilizers, and it causes algae blooms, harmful to both marine life and human health too. So I've said this a bunch of times. You probably don't need me to repeat it. My story starts on land, but that's not the tragedy. One such farm that practices regenerative farming is at Pennypack Farm. And as a volunteer there, I feel they truly embody people, planet, and prosper. It can feel overwhelming and quite daunting at the thought of growing your own food, but that's what it's all about. People learn together, and that's how you build community. People struggling, questioning, learning, and succeeding together. That's how you evolve from individual to group to community. And at Pennypack Farm and Education Center, they bring families, children, and community, community members of all backgrounds together to learn where their food comes from and how their food is grown while also protecting ecosystem health through things like cover crops, soil tests. Um, they actually do soil tests. Excess is just as bad as deficiency. So they use soil tests to determine um, how much is in there or they produce organic fertilizers to limit um, it does the composition doesn't break down as it would in normal synthetic fertilizers at Pennypack Farm. And a big part of Pennypack Farm is education um, and access. Every year, um, children from our Metro Philly area come from the college settlement to learn where food comes from. And the farm also instills a love of learning and a nurturing safe outdoor environment. They also hold uh, regular cl uh, classes. And as a volunteer, I found that um, I'm always meeting someone new, someone new from my community, and it builds just such a great sense and uh, growing together as individuals as well. And so all in all, people, communities banding together can have a critical role in environmental governance. And I think the community shared agriculture penny platform does exactly this. From land to ocean, it's how everyday people and communities can come together to sustainably manage the resources for the common good. I hope to start an eco ambassador program at my school with my environmental club. And I also have a grill up club where we put girls at the center of building a more just and resilient future, fighting inequality and addressing the urgency of climate change. It starts with you. We're all so critical in this movement of change and climate action and storytelling, especially. And I think ArcGIS is going to be one of the evolving ways we do so. So thank you so much for the uh, opportunity. Um, and uh, thank you, Ms. Freeman, for being such an excellent mentor and working with the entire Eco Ambassador team. This was a wonderful experience. And I can't wait to move forward. Thank you. So much, so much to Chris and Bonnie, who's not here as well. Such inspiring presentations, the content, the way you presented it to us. I love how action focused and solutions focused it all was. So thank you all so much. Uh, we have one more uh, student story maps presenter. Uh, we have Ashley Jun, who is a middle school student at Milburn Middle School. And she's gonna present to us about fast fashion and the threats it poses to our ocean. So Ashley, if you could, Share your screen. Yeah. Um, While Ashley is sharing her screen, I have to tell you when we were in the session where Ashley was sharing, everyone in my group was like, fast fashion, polyesters and clothes. That's what we're totally interested in. I know Sophia was in an action research project and I think you probably could have like, or you probably can still, grow your network around that um, pretty easily, because I can see how that um, uh, was a catalyst to thinking right away. Thanks, Ashley. Thank you so much for the kind words, Ms. Freeman. Um, okay, so hello, my name is Ashley June, 
And as Tara just explained, I am a current eighth grader in Melbourne Middle School in New Jersey. And first of all, I would like to say that I am very honored to be in this um, meeting and be able to share my ideas that I'm really passionate about among these and along with these amazing panelists that who are in this meeting and the audiences as well. So to start with, I have research about fast fashion. So fast fashion speeding toward ocean pollution, invisible crisis. Since the late 1990s, fast fashion has been booming all over the world. While these fast fashion brands attract a large amount of customers and success, it leads to environmental degradation. In fact, as the textile and apparel industry continues to produce enormous amounts of clothes, microplastic pollution gets worsened. The UN states that 10% of carbon emissions and 20% of wastewater, which is a worldwide quantification, is directly resulted from the fast fashion industry. So this first part of my story map is basically an abridged version of the main ideas that I will be discussing today, which is how both humans and water system are being negatively impacted from the fast fashion industry. So to start off with, how horrible is the situation that humans are facing right now? And to start off, I would like to just define the term of fast fashion. So fast fashion is a term defined as an expensive, substandard, trendy, and disposable quality of clothing. An easy way to actually view this idea is to think of how the word fast and fast fashion indicates the speed of trend, where when one person wears a particular clothing in a run runway or like a show, people will buy the same exact replica piece of clothing without no hesitation. However, this idea is so important to notice because these low quality clothing that people buy from fast fashion brands will never be fully disposed or break up, meaning that piles of clothing and pollutants are constantly going to be increasing in the status quo. To go into specifics, here are some of the effects of fast fashion. And who actually produces the mic who actually produces microfibers? Microfibers are the strands that are shed from our clothes after washing or simply and mainly produced from washing machines. Washing machines are of course an essential tool for humans in the status quo, but without notice, they are harming our environment in a really bad way. And below this I have a quantification that says that seven hundred thousand microfibers are let out in a standard wash cycle. So that means that in multiple wash cycles, the number will drastically change, but in a broader perspective, and even in the entire world, the number of microfibers that will be produced just like in a day will be having a such a high scope. And moving on to toxic textile dyes. Um, so when I was researching toxic textile dyes, I actually found this topic the most interesting part because of the quantification that they actually provided me and because I'm a person who likes who has a lot of like colorful clothes, I realized how much like what I like by by just myself buying clothes, I realized how much impact negative impact that I'm actually making in the environment. So the general idea is that I have written down here is that by creating garments, it requires a, a big amount of chemicals and water, which ultimately means that it is, as it is also actually stated here, that to create a dye fabric, people have to release tainted, toxic, undrinkable, and polluted water to nature using fresh and clean water. So one thing that I really wanted to point out here is that what the environment um, protect, environmental Protection Administration in China states that one third of our planet's rivers are classified as too polluted for any direct human contact. So I think this code and the phrase itself really uh, um, increasing the awareness to, to people of how much by, be, by just simply buying clothes and washing, how much it is actually impacting our environment and our world. So the second section is about how, the, uh, how our ocean is actually changing from these microfiber pollutants. I started by responding to the question of how does fast fashion pollute the ocean? So the answer of this was actually really honestly like given in the first section. However, here I, in the second section, I really focus a lot about polyester, which is a most relied and commonly used and also the most polluting fiber. And I can probably guess that in one of anyone's like closed cl closet or um, a wardrobe, you will have at least one um, polyester made cloth. And so in the next section here, I really discuss, um, describe about what microfiber actually is, and I really go into depth about what microfibers are. So the most important key takeaway here is not only that it harms our environment, but that it 
it is not visible to the human naked eye. This makes it so much more complicated to spread the awareness of microfiber pollutions, but it is also hard because people cannot, people will never realize the stiffness of the issue unless they are actually exposed and introduced to this issue. And the following section is a summarization of a research that was conducted in the Beaufort Sea and the Canadian Arctic Archipelago. The discovery here is quite surprising as they found that in the Northern Sea, 92% of sea samples were already contam contaminated with microfibers. And among the number, three quarter of them are, were already polyester, further, which further emphasizes the humanity's actual addiction into buying polyester clothing and garments. So this is like a map that I have created. So if you actually look close to the map here, the Beaufort Sea is located in the Arctic Ocean. And here I also included the results, which will be, which is just aligned here, as I just stated that 75% was already polyester. And the second research of in the Canadian Arctic Archipelago, which is lying north to the mainland of Can mainland of Can Canada, as you can see in the map, the um, results were pretty interesting to me because, as it's stated here, it says the inf infrared signature illustrate that fibers have been found in the east were fifty percent more longer, and it was mostly virgin polyester. And this infrared signature, just for basic inf basic background or information, it is a Infra infrared signature is changed depending on the amount of sunlight, different in a difference in chemical process and the bacterial decomposition. So I have also included a link to CNN if you want to know more about polyester fibers. And moving on, I ha just included a small quote um, um, that was said by Steve Allen. And here I this is basically a I wrote about how. I wrote about how the chronic microfiber exposure ex exposure causes cellular change cellular changes in fish and may disrupt endocrine systems. So these are some of the background information about the, these Japanese medica fishes that were used during this ex particular experiment. And below this, these are some of the results. And ultimately, and overall, after reading a um, long documented and results PDF, I have found that the exposure of highly concentrated chronic, chronic microfiber exposure led to damage of conditions for fishes. So we can already quite see that um, microfibers are not a good resources for uh, fishes or any kind of marine animals. And lastly, for this section, I wrote about how fast fashion and as companies are trying to fit the demands for of following the trends of people and trying to create as much pieces as possible so that they can make some kind of profit out of it, they are basically mass producing clothes. And unfortunately, the amount of water that takes up to make a single garment is extremely high. Manufacturing one t-shirt is equivalent to 2,700 liters of water. And realize that this amount of water is also equivalent to the amount of water that a person will drink in a three-year period. So that just emphasizes how much water that is needed to just create one t-shirt, one single t-shirt. So here I would just like actually like to mention an example that I have um, included, which is in Aral Sea, once known as the Forest Colossal Lake and currently lying between Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, have actually fully dried up because um, as fashion, fa fashion industries continue to develop and grow, um, basically they have to use more water and because of this excessive usage of water, uh, um, Aral Sea had to dry, dry up, the, Aral Sea had to dry up eventually, which they have already been, they have dried up right now. So moving on, last section is about us, we, how people can actually reduce fast fashion. I started this section with a more of a positive note that more companies in the status quo, more organizations, more small businesses, and even large businesses are really trying to change their initiatives to make renewable and sustainable garments. So along the way, I have met, any, met many standard and extremely or and ex extremely exemplary organization and small businesses that have been really concerned with microplastic pollution and have already made a small step towards solving it. So one of the most famous brands of all times, as 
I'm pretty sure a lot of people know is Patagonia, which is a sustainable company that is leading the word towards decreasing microfiber pollution. So Patagonia's original clothing has actually created a huge amount of microfibers. And after the company actually realized how much microfibers they are producing, they have to they have started to take multiple actions. And these are some of the plans right over here are the some of the plans that Patagonia is currently working on to lessen microfiber pollution from wardrobes and garments that they are creating. Next is our Sila company, which the which this company actually released a microfiber filtration technology that removes microplastics at the 2019 IFA. So they have created an environmentally friendly washing machine using PET bottles, um, PET bottles, and the importance of this PET bottles is that a single washing machine that they have created, this washing machine tub, is created using nearly 25 million PET bottles. So they are really exercising this recycling process. But also in these um, washing machines, they have a microfiber filtration technique added so that they can also prevent harmful fibers being released to the sea, which can protect a lot of marine animals. And here we have some organizations like Marine Leecher Solutions, and they are aiming for people to respect the resources of plastics rather than just trashing them out on the beach or the waterways. And in order to do this, they have created um, six key object objectives that will convey ideas about marine or waste and marine waste and debris. debris. So first is raising awareness. Second, is researching for more facts and additional facts. Um, so that they can grasp more ideas about what microfiber pollution is. And by third, by promoting the best policies. Next, by spreading knowledge. Fifth, by enhanced recovery. And lastly, by preventing pellet losses. And lastly, one of the major key takeaways that I was aiming from my story map was what you and people in general can do to decrease microfiber pollution. Um, first of all, you can choose clothes or fibers like linen that has a low water consumption. Second, you can choose a sustainable brand like Patagonia, Levi's, or H&M. You can also wash clothes, your clothes less often, so maybe once or twice a week, not like every single day. And you can also hesitate before dumping out your old clothes, and maybe you can wear once or twice even more because that can even make a huge difference. And you can be open in using secondhand or rented garments. So there's a lot of shops out in the internet that has been booming um, nowadays, like called Depop and Dreadup. And these um, websites actually provide you a really high quality of clothing. So you can shop th in those brands. And you can also do some research and learn more about the clothing brands you buy from. You can donate your baby or old clothes that you do not want or need anymore so people can use it as a second hand. So you can sell it online in websites like eBay, Poshmark, and Etsy. And I'm pretty sure there's more brands out there that you can actually do that. And you can even donate in your local thrift stores or in a used clothing stores. You can use social media like Facebook Marketplace. I know that um, a lot of people use this Facebook Marketplace. You can get a really great deal in those websites as well. And you can also drop your clothes off in shopping mall textile bins. Um, lastly, you can use your voice to let others know that you want specific policies being established to decrease microfiber pollution. So you should really stand up, speak, yourself, speak up for yourself if you want a particular thing and really voice yourself to the government and private government or private or global companies that you want these kind of XYZ rules so that possibly people can be able to possibly people can be able to try and have the endeavor to decrease microfiber pollution in the future. And lastly, I would like to end this story map with two strong quotes that I have discovered along the way of my research. First of all, that we should all take responsibility. We should all take responsibility for the actions that, that we are making and how that is influencing and changing our environment. Second, that microfiber pollution is a global environmental threat. Microfiber pollution is an issue that is irreversible at the end of the day. So people can, and this is because people cannot fully divert the effects made by the microfiber pollution when it has already been imposed on society. And this is why we as humans should all try our best to protect our environment in the best way possible. Best way possible. And slow fashion is the only sustainable future for the industry and our planet. And that is end of my presentation. 
Thank you very much for everyone who has listened all the way along. And I'm hoping from my small effort and endeavor to actually tell people around us about the seriousness, seriousness of marine water pollution from microplastics and the fast fashion industry. People will able to um, change their via- behavior and also help to decrease microfiber pollution and create a better environment around them. Again, thank you so much. I am very honored and grateful that I was able to speak in this in, um, very huge event. And thank you for, thank you Tara for always helping me and along the way of um, always helping me and looking over my story maps multiple times together. It has really helped me a lot. And also Miss Angar who um, really helped and um, directed the entire um, lecture during our um, Eco Ambassador program. Thank you so much. And I really appreciate everything that you ha- um, the Eco Ambassador program has provided for me. This is so amazing, Ashley. Thank you so much for uh, uh, the entire story map. It's very, very exhaustive. And uh, I think it will really uh, motivate a lot of us to become more microplastic conscious and see where we can get, you know, and, uh, you know, the list that you have. I think it's uh, really amazing to, to make people aware and take up resp- responsibility. I completely agree with you on that. And I hope to be able to share your, since you and I are from the same town, I hope to share your um, your story map to our mayor and uh, the rest of the Melbourne Climate Action Group here as well. So congratulations on your fantastic work. Moving on to a very important uh, section now, and thank you, Andrew, for waiting uh, so patiently. Just wanted to... Uh, share another amazing work um, that Andrew Friedman and Iveta Silova are working on. It is called Turn Around Cards, Turn It Around Cards. And they have used cards, um, uh, you know, language, in t- also in terms of artistic creation to convince the uh, environmental leaders on hearing from our youth. So this is a fascinating movement. I I think Andrew has created. Andrew has a background in filmmaking, is an educator and has been doing this for the past 20 years. Uh, Andrew, we wanted to know from you, how did you come up with this inspiration and what is your end objective uh, with your uh, collaboration with Arizona State University, um, Open Society Foundations as well as UNESCO and and maybe if you can share some uh, cards with us, I think that will be, that will motivate us also to uh, understand where all this is going. You are on mute, and Yes. After all that time, and I still missed the mute button. <laughs> uh, hi, everyone. Thanks for, um, thanks for coming together today. Um, so I, yes, I'm an artist, um, and uh, I run an organization called the Artist Literacies Institute, uh, and I work, uh, so I'm also a, a, an arts-based researcher, and I connect artists, uh, as I say, to big systems. Uh, every artist in their heart of hearts, I think, feels like they can uh, solve all the world's problems, um, and, uh, and I try and, and help them figure out how to do that, because engaging in really big systems, um, as you all know, uh, can be daunting, right? So trying to find those kind of small and local uh, local engagements that that create leverage to much bigger things. So uh, you asked how it started. I'll, I'll tell you very quickly. Uh, last year, I was working with an artist named Adrian Yinnick uh, and a handful of other artists in the midst of the pandemic. Um, and we were asked by disaster relief organizations to address uh, crisis in communal grieving. Um, and the fact that in the midst of uh, the pandemic, uh, people could not uh, grieve their losses together at funerals. And artists are producers of culture. They're the producers of our rituals. They're the producers of our traditions. Uh, And these uh, relief organizations said, perhaps we need new traditions and new rituals um, for this moment. And so we developed a set of cards called the artist's grief deck Um, and uh, what we did was commissioned artists from all around the country in fact ended up getting submissions from all around the world to provide original artworks and on the back side of each one of these um, is what we call a grief prompt 
Uh, so working with grief experts, we learned that people uh, need action. Uh, they need to take action. They need something to do. Uh, and so each grief prompt gives somebody uh, a, a prompt, something to do, a suggested action. It might be breathing, it might be meditation, it might be building, it might be art making. Um, and so this becomes a toolkit that you can use in isolation or with, you know, close, uh, you know, within a household um, to process grief and loss. And it was from this model, uh, this kind of toolkit model that this new project emerged. Uh, so Yvette de Silovo, who sends her regrets um, at ASU, uh, connected with, uh, who, who also works with Adrian Yannick, uh, connected with us and said, can we do this same kind of thing for climate education? Uh, and we thought about building a toolkit that's rooted in art. And uh, the reason that I work in art and that I think art uh, is, is meaningful and valuable is that uh, we, we talk about in these spaces, we talk about data a lot. Uh, there's tons and tons of data. And I see art as types of data that we've not named. Um, they are ways of knowing about the world and ways of, of relating to our environment that um, we, we don't have concrete names for. It's, it's ineffable. Uh, it's often embodied, it's invisible, it's intuitive, uh, but it's extremely profound and extremely important to the way that we relate uh, to one another and to the world around us. And so, uh, so we decided to build a toolkit um, that was going to be voiced by youth. And uh, the goal was uh, many, many of you have used flashcards at some point in your educational experience. Um, they're the kind of paragon of rote learning, you know, two plus two equals four. Um, and so what we wanted to do was we wanted to create a set of flashcards, uh, but with youth for the grownups in the room. Uh, and so we sort of turned it around, which is the, the source of the, the name of the project and commissioned artworks from artists um, under uh, 28 years old from all around the world and also asked, uh, youth leaders and thinkers and writers to send us their writing, their responses to seven key prompts about uh, education and uh, our relationship to nature. Um, and uh, our, our, our kind of basis here was that uh, modern education has really separated humans from nature. Um, and art is a really wonderful way to, to kind of bring those together uh, to sort of radically reimagine our relationship to the planet and relationship to our uh, to our surroundings. Um, and uh, actually, if I can, if I'm able to share, um, so you will be the first, uh, really the first audience outside of our production team uh, to catch a glimpse of any of this. Uh, the cards themselves um, are, at the printers right now, we sent them. Uh, so we, we had this open call for artists, circulated it around the world, got hundreds and hundreds of submissions it, within six weeks during the summer. Um, we just started this project in May and our goal is to have it done in time for uh, the pre-COP Futures of Education uh, event in Milan at the end of this month. Um, so we've been really sprinting. So we got five, 600 submissions from around the world. We selected 80 of them, paired them with prompts, uh, paired them with writing, um, and, and created the set of flashcards. So it's gonna be a printed kit meant to be used um, in uh, policy making spaces, educational policy spaces, classrooms, um, where we can see frameworks and ideas that, were, that are presented by youth. Um, and, and directed toward those who are making decisions about, uh, about education. So this is our landing page. Um, in addition to the printed deck, we're gonna have a website that's gonna have all the cards in it. So this is currently our staging site, which means it is a non-public website that has uh, just the cards. Um, each time I reload this site, here we are, um, there are new cards on it because there's a team at ASU that is loading this artwork up as we speak um, because we're, we're meant to launch by the end of this week. But what's gonna happen is when you come to turnitaroundcards.org, 
um, you're going to be able to see the entire collection of cards. And these are some of the artworks that were sent to us by artists um, everywhere. Um, and you can see that um, we ask, how do we turn it around? These seven questions that we asked um, youth around the world to answer come up. Um, what do we need to learn to ensure that we and our planet thrive and survive? Uh, to let other youth know where you find hope and resilience as you face an uncertain future and what excites you about the future. Uh, tell policymakers about your non-human teachers, such as animals, plants, nature, ancestors, or technology. What do they teach you and how? Tell leaders what you want them to know or remember when they make decisions about your future. Share a lesson that you have learned from your ancestors that you want to pass on to future generations and tell leaders why climate education should be included in your learning today. So these are the seven questions that we've asked young people around the world to address answers meant for, uh, think of the ministers of education uh, who will be meeting in Milan um, in a month. Think of the, uh, the people who are gonna be coming together at COP26. These kinds of events, these kinds of spaces, we feel this is gonna be a workshop and learning tool um, here. So young people like the folks on this call will be able to go in with a deck of these cards and have a structured discussion and, and an opportunity to present these views and frameworks. Um, and if you click on any one of these, um, you're gonna be brought to all of the cards that answer that question. So here's an artwork, we turn, we go to it, we see that it's called minimalism, we click on it um, and we can see the artwork was made by an artist in Michigan. Uh, the writing that's associated with it was uh, given to us by a young writer in Zimbabwe. Um, and here is an answer to that question, uh, that, to that prompt. So there will be 84 of these cards um, and also a set of uh, what we call partner cards. So student organizations, uh, such as uh, students organizing for sustainability, the Global Youth Biodiversity Network, uh, the Donut Economics Action Lab. We've got a whole number of partners who have also provided their frameworks to a, to a set of cards. Um, and the card deck is also gonna include a bunch of statistics and facts that are gonna help drive these discussions. So we're gonna put this all into a box. We're gonna get it into your hands and, uh, and, and set you loose into classrooms and conference rooms and meeting rooms uh, to put this to work. And hopefully through the combined actions of of art, that ineffable uh, kind of uh, intuitive uh, way that we respond to art with uh, these more concrete frameworks and ways of thinking that are provided by you young people, um, something is going to give and we might be able to turn it around. This is so fantastic, Andrew. Thank you so much. Uh, I feel that our next workshop or our next meeting should start with uh, your card to set the stage and then we can get into our, you know, whatever our topic is. So this is fantastic. Uh, and we hope to, you know, also learn from your experience and also from uh, maybe with us to see how we can, uh, how we can use these in classrooms. Maybe we need to develop uh, lesson plans. I know Betsy's here. Maybe she can, you know, give us some thoughts on how uh, this could be done. Uh, but thank you so much for sharing our the first preview and we are so lucky that we got to see it first and then the COP26 leaders and education ministers will be following uh, soon. Uh, so this is, uh, this is fantastic and congratulations that you were able to do this in such a short time. I think this is what is needed when we have to tackle climate issues. We have to get it going, get our initiatives going in the fastest mode so that we can send out those voices um, to everyone. So thanks uh, for sharing your presentation. I'll hand over to Tara for uh, another section which talks about uh, teacher resources. And this could be a great segue into how we can use these turn it around cards as well as story maps uh, uh, on, the, on our platform that she's been able to uh, develop so far. I don't know if she's around. I'm here. <laughs> I was having some internet earlier, but or internet issues, but they seem better now. <laughs> um, and thank you so much, Andrew. I just wanted to say that um, I feel that whether we intend to or not, all of our sessions always end up coming to this point of the critical role of art in helping to, you know, inspire our imaginations to think of new ways of being, new ways of solving these problems. 
Uh, so we are very excited to see how we can integrate these. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen and I'm gonna walk you all through our work so far in developing this Mission 4.7 platform. I think that's what this side event was titled, right? Our pre-launch event. So this is kind of the culminating event. And the reason why we wanted to focus more of the session on hearing from students, hearing from people who are developing these innovative resources because the goal of this platform really is to share all these different resources and help connect those to standards that hopefully educators can use to kind of connect the dots with the curriculum that they're working with now and how to make those links to these SCG 4.7 issues. Sort of how uh, Dr. Tibbetts was mes uh, mentioning that, that that link is what we want to support within this. So I'm going to kind of walk you through some of the resources we've been developing uh, in pr preparation for the launch of this platform. And really our goal is to have all in one place this set of implementation guidelines, learning expectations, teaching and learning resources to support different education stakeholders from policymakers all the way down to educators and students, community, uh, grassroots activists who are doing this work. Um, and we started this work earlier this year by creating our content contributors hub. So that's the first thing I wanna show you here. Um, so this is on our edforsd.org website and this content contributed, contributors hub, um, our goal was to kind of share this out with those in our equal ambassador network, other youth organizers in our network uh, to give them kind of some tools and ideas to start creating lesson plans and resources that we could use to populate this hub that we're creating. So on the content contributors hub, we have um, in this read section, we have links to uh, the online course of, for the Age of Sustainable Development, which was developed by the director of our center, Professor Jeffrey Sachs. There's also a link here to uh, some online chapters of the book on Google Books. Um, then in this watch section, we have a link to a Udemy course, a free Udemy course that we developed that uh, it's called SDG 4.7 Across Curriculum and Education Spaces. And that is mostly intended for educators and education decision makers to start thinking about how to integrate these issues into policy, teacher mindset, pedagogical practice, how to connect with communities, and then how to measure and assess uh, the progress toward this work. Um, and then we have our Get Ideas section down here. So here we have uh, kind of a video resource that walks through some ideas for how content creators can start thinking about how to apply some of the case studies or some of the actions you're taking in your communities and build lessons around that that are really focused on solutions and kind of bringing the standards to life with real life uh, examples. Um, and then, so we have the toolkit there as well. Um, I got everything. So the toolkit looks like this, it has some examples of uh, the kind of framework that we ask contributors to use, Understanding by Design, which is a framework that um, was developed by uh, scholars Wiggins and McTai. And it's used by a lot of educators to kind of ground learning in what are the big ideas, the big essential questions, and then how, what do you want learners to learn by the end? And then how do you plan backwards to kind of reach that end goal for learning? So our template walks through that kind of process. These are examples that are here of how you can take a case study of uh, an action you've taken in your community or an initiative that you're inspired by and kind of develop uh, subject focused or curriculum aligned lessons around, the, around them. And then the template, we have an example lesson plan using our template and then we have a blank version of the template there. So all that is there on the contributors hub. And then the submit section is where uh, content contributors can um, upload the uh, file of their lesson plan, or they can also use our Google form, which is the same thing where they enter in the fields. So those are all the tools and resources that we have there on con our content contributors hub. Uh, so we've been working on that for, for some months, kind of collecting some initial list, uh, lessons alongside the work we've been doing with eco ambassador, ab ambassadors to develop the story maps, which we also want to translate into lesson plans. Um, and then we have a couple other pages on the site um, under this Mission 4.7 tab, Voices of Young Leaders. That's a place where we want to showcase examples of how young people and how classrooms are actually taking these resources and implementing them so that we can kind of show what's working. Um, and then, so, so we kind of had started that work there, started uh, an initial collection of lessons. Um, but now working with, uh, in collaboration with our Mission 4.7 partners, we've been building on this work to create our guiding principles platform. So this is the beta version of the website that we have. Um, and it, it's, it's linked here um, 
if you click on mission 4.7 on our FRSD page, it'll bring you here. Um, and so we have seven parts here. So the first part is kind of the big picture. What's our theoretical framework for SDG 4.7? Um, then part two, uh, planning principles for implementing SDG 4.7. And this is kind of just walking through some of the big picture, uh, some examples of how different countries and states have, um, have worked to try to integrate some of these concepts. So, you know, I've, I've uh, as Dr. Tibbs was mentioning earlier, and I think Andrew, you mentioned it too, that when we're thinking about these big problems, the action piece is, is how we kind of deal with the, the negative feelings that might, or the feelings of hopelessness that might come along with some of these big challenges. And New Zealand is actually an example of a country that has implemented a climate change and well being curriculum that talks about eco anxiety, that has that uh, action civics component, how to take action on these issues. Um, so we have some different examples there in, in part two, talking about uh, examples of how some states and countries are doing this already. Um, part three is kind of the main section of this where we're presenting uh, sample learning expectations and I'll get that get to that in a minute. Part four is where we talk about lesson planning for SDG 4.7. So that's more um, for a teacher audience. Um, then we have teacher pedagogy and professional development. And that talks about both in-service, pre-service, uh, professional development for school leaders as well. Um, we have part six, which focuses on assessment, measurement, and metrics. And that has some examples, tools, some ideas for how um, at different levels, education stakeholders can start thinking about how to uh, collect some data or some process indicators about how implementation of SDG 4.7 is happening in their communities and in their schools. And then um, part seven at the bottom is education policy. And that's where we get into a little more details on those case studies of what's happening in, in different places. Um, so I wanna get into um, part three here, which is the learning expectations section. So this is, um, again, Dr. Tibbs was kind of alluding to this earlier, that this is that need, right? Um, how, how can we integrate all these big ideas when teachers, you know, have a curriculum they're working with, you know, have all these, uh, so, you know, challenges that they have to overcome to make time, to make space, to integrate these, uh, these concepts in their teaching and learning. So our goal was really, you know, how can we create something that can be helpful and easy to integrate into as many curriculums around the world as possible? Of course, you can't make something that's going to fit everywhere, but hopefully there's something for everyone here and what we're working to create. Um, and so the approach we took was starting with UNESCO's learning objectives. And I believe I have those on a tab here. So um, I think this is from 2017, UNESCO released these learning objectives for the sustainable development goals. And uh, what we did was we took these goals and tried to map them to examples of state and country curricula, starting with New Jersey. Um, and the reason we chose New Jersey is because um, it's the first state in the US to uh, plan to integrate climate change education across standards K to 12. Um, it's also one of the first states in the country that has committed to um, diversifying and creating a more inclusive curriculum with the Amistad uh, Commission that uh, integrates black history into, you know, across subjects again, K to 12. So these are two good reasons why New Jersey is kind of a welcoming place for the kind of ideas that we're pushing here. Um, and our goal is to do similar mapping exercises with other country curriculum to further refine uh, these learning expectations. So with the UNESCO standards here, it was a great starting point. However, the way it's organized is there's 15 learning objectives per SDG. So for each of the 17 SDGs, there's 15, and they're broken up into three categories, cognitive, social, emotional, and behavioral learning expectations. So while this is a useful framework, the standards lack grade level specificity. And uh, so, so the same standards are intended for kindergarten up to high school and you know, lifelong learning beyond that. Um, and they don't necessarily map easily to the kind of core curriculum standards that educators are familiar with. So our aim with the mapping exercise and development of these learning expectations was to kind of bridge that gap uh, and using the state curriculum to guide us on adapting the UNESCO standards to be more applicable to specific grade level standards that teachers are more familiar with. Um, and we started with the sciences and the social science standards. Um, so here on the site is where uh, you can explore what we have so far. So this section here just kind of explains what I just explained about our process. And then we have these expanding sections here by grade band. So we have lower primary, upper primary, lower secondary, and upper secondary. 
Um, and then below that, if you want to read more about the different kind of frameworks that inform this development process, kind of overlapping uh, learning frameworks that fit under this SDG 4.7 umbrella, such as social emotional learning, 21st century skills, green skills, we have more literature down here at the bottom that you can read more on. But really kind of the bread and butter of what we're trying to share here is this, uh, these learning expectations. So we pop this down, you'll see that it's kind of organized in the same three buckets as the UNESCO standards. We have cognitive, social, emotional, and behavioral expectations. Um, and then after each standard, there's a link here of resources where, that'll take you to a page that has lesson plans, activities, um, and more resources. So this is where we wanna put the story maps, turn it around cards, all the things that you all are developing. We want to share those on these uh, individual pages. So we're still building these pages. That's why we're not uh, sharing this widely yet, but we have a couple here as examples for you to look at um, today. So, you know, for this cognitive learning expectation, we have define research questions, develop criteria and constraints for successes and failures, make observations, gather information, and analyze data in order to design and conduct fair tests of potential sustainability solutions. And this language actually does come very much from the early primary science standards from New Jersey, which also maps the next generation science standards that are used in many states across the US. Um, but it also links the UNESCO standards talking about uh, sustainability solutions and um, evidence-based solutions. And then some of the examples we have here like green roof, school gardens. So based on that, you know, we have some resources here that were actually developed by different partnerships we had. You know, we had to do these activity kits um, during the pandemic to kind of promote some of this learning at home, um, things that students could take home and do with their families. Um, and that was created in partnership with the SDG Student Hub at Columbia University. We have this um, bike riding lesson that Radhika created that's uh, wonderful and includes some data collection and getting, getting folks out on a bike and exercising as an alternative transport. Um, we have conserving energy lesson plan that was developed by some student teachers at the City University in New York College of Education. And then this is just another resource that um, was a great one that's out there online um, by the Whole Kids Foundation that is a big collection of how you can use a school garden and build lesson plans around uh, school gardening. So this is just, you know, an example of a page um, that we'll have here. And um, well, we're hoping to, to continue building on. So I think, you know, I know we're already at time. If we have a few more minutes, we would love to hear any reflections or thoughts that you all have on how we can make this resource as useful as possible for educators, um, for folks in different parts of the world. Um, I know right now we did start our initial analysis with a, a US-based curriculum, but we do wanna expand on that um, and kind of touch on those curriculum points that are, are as common as we can get globally, you know, in the sciences, things like that. So I would like to first, um, uh, if Betsy's still with, it, with us, see if you, um, you know, as one of our core educators who uh, contributes to our work and we value your insights so much, um, how can we present this? How can we organize this? What kind of resources would you want to see on here? Um, yeah. Any thoughts? Yeah, I think I have to pick my jaw up off the table first because it is a massive amount of work that you've undertaken because anybody who has written curriculum and knows all the different frameworks that are all very good, but that, you know, it's the, all the riches and then teachers get overwhelmed. I definitely appreciate all the um, citations in there too, that uh, wonky part of me. Um, when I would, so fabulous, first fabulous. The, you know, I was thinking about um, the work that Andrew had done and it reminded me of a, um, a project a group of students had done to engage um, K to three students in actually learning about the SDGs. And they did it as a, um, a card game because of course kids love play. And, um, and so it was reminding me that um, like little snippets of video. I mean, I leave here so inspired by, um, you know, all the work that I've seen. And I think sometimes the, um, that's what we miss, even in the most well organized, perfect lesson plan that, you know, which, you know, is probably the dream of many 
educators in you know the pandemic world today. Um, I think that would be wonderful. And you know, I think there was a question that came up in the chat from somebody that was about, you know, how do we match people, you know, from all over the world? And it it of course reminded me of um, um, Radhika when you introduced us to um, Bluebell International and having like that kind of um, discourse at an educator level. And then I think, and I think I like snuck ahead and read this in your presentation anyway, that you were looking at some like a, a youth component of it. So I think um, the, uh, the work is massive. It's massive. And I think they're, you know, being in New Jersey and knowing that the climate standards are coming and, you know, we're in this kind of gap year due to the pandemic that, um, you know, school districts are, this is what they're going to want, right? At, but it's that piece of, how do I use it? You know, I have, you know, all of these things and the, you know, I, I go back to what, Tara, I think I've heard you talk about a lot. I think it might be your background in um, maybe community building or community organizing or something like that. And so I think that um, figuring out how that can work. And then I think, oh, okay, eco ambassadors who are here right now to do this you know, presentation. And it made me think, all right, would we make the commitment to take you know each one of your storyboards or some aspect of your work and um, transform that into something that would appeal to students and then also appeal to educators who may have that um, it's got to list the standards because when I put my lesson plans or my unit plans, you know, into the system, it's going to force, you know, uh, the only ones that may be uh, populated are the named standards. So I think I will ask that question right now. Ashley, Sophia, Tatiana, and I, I know uh, we can easily get uh, Chris in. Um, how about that? How about, you know, we um, bring maybe story maps alive? Maybe, you know, I love Andrew, I, you know, I would totally love to take, you know, what Andrew uh, has done because we saw it work so well with um, K to three students. So I think I'm going to hold, and as a good teacher, I know that you allow wait time for um, students to, you know, provide their response. So I'll um, leave that airtime open right now. Awaiting response. Um, I just wanted to reflect that with the experience of the story maps, um, the platform gave my team members and I the ability like to map and influence and most importantly educate our story. I really see the experience and ideas that were developed through our local community spread to diverse audiences from around the world. And the power to unite these facts and our perspective into this like vibrant story was so beautiful to see over the past couple of months that we have worked on it. And these statistics transformed into these life-changing, scarring images, such as every minute a um, million pl plastic water bottles are being sold. And now that's a lot of plastic waste. And I know as a high school student, I learned the truth about our spoiled oceans more and more when I kept researching for this narrative. And I came to the conclusion that although we're the primary cause, we are also part of the solution and we must do our part as students in school as consumers for um, on our earth. So it was really important to be aware of that. Tatiana, as the teacher of the open-ended question, how do you see then um, youth taking that message forward? How do, how do you envision yourself taking that message forward? Because I agree, it was totally powerful and it was chock full of 
economics, math, language arts, you know, uh, the arts, social studies, the AP geography, like every single thing that we want to get in there. So um, how do we share that? Um, I think we need to apply our passions and be really passionate about like the topic we choose um, and get a team together to work on it um, and just form a community of active thinkers and find like a solution locally to work on and um, keep building on that, see the result of it and then sort of uh, document your story through the story map, um, like inspire it or educate it through classrooms. Um, yeah, yeah I, I actually kind of love that if I'm understanding that the right way that um, it's a, doing a story map about how you brought that process to life because maybe for some people, you know, um, teachers or students like having that um, guidance and you know if there's one thing I learned over the summer is scroll fatigue don't have scroll fatigue and and I think that's also um, you know from the pedagogical standpoint that you know bite-sized learning you know maybe that's a part of it and then getting discussion in there and I know you did a really fantastic job of that with beekeeping with the Girl Scouts, Tatiana, right? So maybe if, um, I'm sure if um, uh, right now Bonnie was here, she would bring up intersectional alliances. And then I would go over to um, Sophia and say, who are those inter intersectional alliances, Sophia? And can you bring them up in your network? And Ashley, you know, I'm coming right over to you because I'm the cold calling teacher on top of it. Uh, thank you for calling on me. <laughs> um, the intersectional alliances are even th ones we sometimes don't even think about. Um, those are students you're working with every single day, the ones in the different classes with you, the ones in your same classes, because it's also about surrounding yourself with different beliefs. That's where dialogue happens, and that's where the story comes to life. And um, it's also networking when you're working with your community and inviting people um welcoming them and i find that at penny pack i um in girl up climate reality and i went to the adirondacks this summer and we did a youth climate recharge so we could get the environmental clubs back up and running um after the pandemic year and i find that is where um growth and we evolve together and when we have these different partnerships we can truly um, focus on the also the intersection of issues, which I'll come back to the sustainable development goals, which can be intertwined to really anything because they are all intertwined. Um, hopefully that answered the question. <laughs> yeah, I, I love that idea because I know having spoken to each one of you about your um, stream maps that when you um, went over to interview the people at Penny Pack, they were Sophia, so excited, right? Oh, yes. Um, when um, I've been volunteering and working with Penny Pack for um, probably since last summer, and one, just being able to witness the change of seasons, it's such just a breath of a fresh air after schoolwork and um, all that. But um, it's when, when, I, when I got to talk to them, um, just while walking around the farm and seeing just the beauty of it all, um, even in the fall, it was absolutely just a moment to take a step and think, yeah, you can do it. You with your community. Um, when I think people plan and prosper, that's exactly what they do. Focus on people, access, nurturing, um, teaching, education, and then also the plan is sustainability, but also teaching people um, how to love food, where their food comes from, and developing a very strong bond with nature and themselves and the community. And then um, one of the uh, I, one of the biggest things, maybe biggest misconceptions, is misconceptions is economic. Uh, maybe growth or prosperity isn't mutually exclusive. That happens uh, with sustainability. Community is where prosperity, I believe, happens. <laughs> I love that. So as the, you know, as a really close listener, I think what I heard was Penny Pack is in 
educational community center for people in suburban and urban environments and that they love story maps and wouldn't it be wonderful if a volunteer developed or shared the penny pack story map in that informal education setting would you commit to that sophia yeah 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 i, I mean the work is is kind of done right and then when you brought up something about um climate reality because i know we both went through that climate reality uh, leadership program i think one of the things that i was really struck by and it um something in the chat reminded me of it that um the we did the international one and it was almost that like speed conversation where you're in different zoom rooms and you suddenly be dropped in and you uh, spark conversation and i remember um meeting somebody from um indonesia and talking to them about um you know problems that they were having with erosion and that and i think that could be something that we could think about and in, in a virtual way maybe with that youth network and it reminded me i think sophia because you were talking about the uh, up at the wild center and that um Youth Climate Summit. Yeah, I think there's, I, I think there's ideas in there, Ashley. What do you think over there in Milburn? And I'm telling you, they all, when we were on that call, everybody was like, oh my God, right? Weren't we reading that MacArthur found Ellen MacArthur Foundation thing on the circular economy and all about how important fast fashion was and yeah, where do you think you're going to go with your stuff? Um, I would definitely like to research more about fast fashion. I know like fast fashion is like such a broad idea, microfiber pollution. It's just so big. And I know that just from my story map, I haven't went like so in depth or like I know there's so much more topics to discover. And from what um, other panelists like um, um, what Sophia, Tatiani all like worked on together, how they like really focused on their like local community. I think that's like a really good idea to do it, especially because I know like in Melbourne, um, I guess like nowadays people like in general are like more interested into clothes. So I feel like there's a, um, there's a more potential into actually like finding and like having some like some kind of survey or experiment in my like in Melbourne basically. Yeah, I like that. And it reminds me of these two different conversations that I had like within the, your triad. Um, Sophia, I think it was around action research that you were doing almost exactly around what Ashley was doing, which was uh, tracking what you wear, right? And it was with a group out of Washington or something, Sophia, right? Tatiana, I know I had long conversations with you about your potential heading into um, fast fashion and how you are a, com a columnist with Vogue, uh, with Czech Vogue, right? And so that makes me think, oh my God, wouldn't it be totally awesome if the three of you put those ideas together? You kind of have the research in there, you have action research in there, you have survey in there, and then you have multiple incredible communications and education platform, clearly through the Eco Ambassador Network, clearly through the Center for Sustainable Development, through your intersectional alliances, and then Tatiana with a column in, um, in Czech Vogue. What do you think? Unmute. Oh, sorry, I think that would be a really great idea to connect us all because we all have different perspective, different talents we can implement um, into something that could grow larger um, and truly influence more people into like learning about sustainable fast fashion, which is basically a part of our daily lives. I mean, we all wear clothes, like we all have something in common with fashion. I think that's what society really needs to know and all the impacts um, that it actually has on us and the environment. 
Yeah, right. It's crazy cool because then you think about the um, tying the bluebells in and suddenly, you know, you start to, you're, you know, in Europe and then you're in Asia and then you're in the U.S. all with, uh, you know, the common theme of youth and fashion. Oh my God, that is like, yeah. Yeah, I, so I would commit to supporting that project um, with uh, uh, four of you. Chris is in New Hampshire, right? And then I'm sure we could get um, more on board. Yeah, I, so I think that's the, like in the, the wonderful uh, platform that you've put together, I think it's that, that spark that as soon as, you know, that building on each other's ideas, that, you know, that kind of action that's, you know, might be a heavy lift for one person, but between, you know, four, five, six, two, whatever, then suddenly it's, you know, very doable. Yeah. Yeah, I think that would be feedback or at least, you know, Thank my you. feedback. Thank you so much. And we are looking forward to such collaborations because, you know, one no one person can complete the whole story, but if we are all working on it together and have our own interests, I think that becomes a beautiful uh, story. And uh, Esri and SDGs today have put together a really nice, you know, framework in terms of um, the story map. So we can definitely use that tool going forward. And also just uh, to get you know uh, some ideas going maybe for later you know for fall we are thinking of having these story maps also reflected as a part of lesson plan so we'll share some ideas with you please feel free to you know have those ideas at least in your perspective when you keep uh, you know when you discuss these story maps so that we can see how we can create lesson plans from the stories that are generated from the youth. So that's something that uh, we will be focusing on this fall and also continuing right in, for summer we had focused on SDG 14, but now carrying uh, broadening it to many other SDGs and involving again global SDG framework with local stories. So that will uh, continue uh, for fall and then we will we plan to do another big uh, New Jersey, New York uh, climate summit around February. So maybe we can culminate all the stories that uh, you would have created with all this amazing collaborations with a summit, um, which will involve many, like it will be like probably a week long summit that we are planning. So I think that will be a nice culmination to um, bringing all the resources together and getting inspired again. Great. So I think we are out of uh, time. I don't know, last reflections from anyone and then we can close for the day. Um, I like to say just like Miss Freeman's idea of like collaborating. I think it's amazing. And like as an eighth grader who like having just like the opportunity, like maybe even to like collaborate with other people, having to hear other pe people's like perspective. I think it's amazing because like um like environment and like just like about um trying to create better like space around me trying to be more eco-friendly about a lot of things that's like what I'm really genuinely passionate about and a person like I'm like really interested into clothes so during the process of like really researching and like creating my story map I'd say like instead of stress I really had so much fun because I can really reflect on myself as well so thank you so much for this opportunity to, again I really appreciate it yeah, and I'd like to circle back with, um, I think we all do have our own stories and we all told that through our story maps. And that when I was, I was thinking about when I had referenced the ocean is a common and, but I think of our stories as a common, it's one big story all together. Our stories make a story. And um, I really do look forward to working in collaboration and a project together. Um, I'm excited for that. <laughs> the next step in our journey <laughs> as you came back okay. but thank you it was an amazing experience Great. thank you so much we are honored to be a part of your story and so that you are giving us this you know amazing opportunity of hearing all your stories and reflecting on our own actions and we will be the platform to uh, you know make your voice heard in a much wider platform so that's it's amazing to you know be come together uh, here Great.
Thank you so much for your time. I know it's getting late, so I'll let you all go and then we will continue our discussions uh, for sure and we'll be in touch again. Thank you so much, uh, Betsy, for all your uh, help and inspiration. Of course, it's wonderful. And so I would just ask because the, um, the, the follow-up or in me says, Sophia, Tatiana, Ashley, maybe Radhika and Tara, you'll um, connect all of those through Week Ambassadors so then we can roll it forward on a schedule that like fits your busy falls that I'm sure you're starting to have, but that we can still make progress and have that February date or whatever, maybe um, if you set a timeline that will uh, shoot for that as a target or something. Okay. Yeah, great. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. For Thank that. you, everyone. Brilliant. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Have a great evening. Bye. Thank you.